so good to be back home. It has uh, been a, a long road trip back up to D.C. and up to Pennsylvania and back home. And I bring you greetings from all sorts of folks along the way. Uh, we had a very blessed trip. And uh, I was very blessed to be able to uh, go on to YouTube and hear all of the testimonies from the March for Marchers for Life and uh, to hear Father Melanson's sermon from last week. That was a kind of fun thing to do. All my kids were, were really excited when I said, hey, we're gonna listen to Father Scott's sermon. And they were like, yay! That's what we wanted to do on a road trip. But I was excited to be able to do it. No offense, Father Scott. Um, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure to be able to travel and to see all of the uh, wonderful folks who gathered from all over the country and to stand together. Um, and it, it highlighted some things that we've been saying throughout this season. One of the key verses that I've been going back to throughout this season comes from Isaiah chapter, chapter 60. We say, Arise, shine. For the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. Behold, darkness covers the land and deep gloom enshrouds the people. And as we stood in front of the Supreme Court, we could see that. Because there were people who we could see that were just in darkness. They were lost. Uh, at one point, there were people who were crying out, a baby's not a baby until it comes out. And somebody said, stop, say that again slowly. A baby isn't a baby until it comes out. You miss it. It's a baby the whole time. Never mind. You're missing it. You're just sitting in darkness. You're covered in deep gloom. You don't understand how lost you are. And I was so proud of our youth who got up in front of these people and they didn't argue with them. And we know how much they like to argue. But they didn't do that. They just stood there and prayed. And I know what an incredible feeling it was to be up on that podium and praying in front of the Supreme Court. And what an incredible feeling it was to be there. And how exciting it was. And I'm just so proud of our youth for being up there and doing that. And it was such a proud Papa moment. And I am glad to be back home and to be with all of you. And it is exciting. And it is exciting to be here on this day, which is the Feast of the Presentation, also called Candlemas. Although this isn't something that we celebrate all the time. It is a day a feast which falls on a specific day, always falls on February 2nd, but we don't always celebrate it. We don't always have church on February 2nd, and we haven't always made a point of going, you know what, this is the day closest to this, so let's observe this. But as I was up north, uh, a lot of churches were talking about getting ready for it. And as I was at Holy Trinity in Pennsylvania, <coughs> Uh, they were getting ready for it. And what was interesting is they still had their, um, their manger scene out. They still had that out. And my kids were like, why do they still have that out? Why, why do they still have their manger scene and Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and the wise men? Why is this all still out? Well, part of being convergence worship, part of having you know the three streams that mold our worship isn't just drawing from the evangelical and the charismatic and the sacramental, but also drawing from different traditions. And one of those traditions says that you keep all of your manger scene stuff out until today, which is 40 days after Christmas. And, you know, if all these other seasons get 40 days, why not Christmas? If Lent gets 40 days, why not have Christmas get 40 days? And so they celebrate Christmas for 40 days, and they take 
the manger scenes, and they have a kind of ceremonial putting it away. And they also bless candles on these days. And that's their sort of tradition. So if you see people doing it, if you see things on Facebook or Instagram or other social media today that's talking about candlemas or the presentation, and you see people putting it, that's what that's about. Now, we've just never done that because that's not been a part of our tradition. But the reason that this is done is because today is 40 days after the birth of Christ. If you go back and you look at the calendar, you go from December 25th to today, it's been 40 days. And we can go back and we can look at Deuteronomy and Leviticus, <laughs> and we can see that in the Old Testament, there was a time where women stayed by themselves in kind of semi-isolation, where they and their child stayed sort of by themselves, they were technically, they were unclean for 40 days. Now, it's nice that medical wisdom has caught up with the Lord, because today, basically, doctors say that, you know, women should sort of, you know, keep to themselves and stay on sort of maternity leave for about six weeks, which comes out to about 40 days. And in the Old Testament, after those 40 days were up, a woman would go to the temple, she would purify herself, present herself to the priest, and if you had a firstborn son, actually all firstborn males were considered holy to the Lord. And if you had any other firstborn animal, you needed to offer it to the Lord, as in, you know, offer it to the Lord with a sacrifice. Conveniently, if you had a firstborn child, you just presented it to the Lord with another offering, and you sort of bought him back from the Lord with this other sacrifice. Now, in the case of the Holy Family here, if you look closely, you see that the doves and the pigeons that they present are the sort of the pauper sacrifice. Because having traveled all the way from Nazareth down to Jerusalem, their coffers had been depleted, and they were not living high on the hog. They were making the pauper sacrifice. Now, one of the things that I love about this story is that I think this is what could potentially be like the centerpiece of convergence worship for us. And I've talked about this before, because what you have here is a family that is attentive to the scriptures. They look at the scriptures and they say, scripture says we ought to worship this way. And they go into the temple and they participate in scripturally based liturgical worship. And in the process of doing that, the Holy Spirit breaks out and they receive a prophetic word, which is exactly what we want from our worship, right? This is what we want. We have people who look at scripture and say, wow, scripture says this is how we ought to worship. So we go to church, we arrange our worship based on what we see in scripture, and we pray that when we do, the Holy Spirit moves in our worship and God anoints our worship. This is exactly what we're looking for. This is like the central verse of the CEC. That in Psalm 115, verse 1. Now, I've talked about these passages before, and I've got to say that if I'm really being honest, this passage that Simeon says, this is probably one of those moving passages of Scripture outside of the passion that I've ever seen. Because... What you have here is this old man who goes to, to the temple faithfully and devoutly and religiously, and he prays on a regular basis. And dispelling this here, you know, we hear that in the, the period of time between Malachi and the ministry of Jesus, that there was not, they called them silent years, that God wasn't moving. It's ridiculous. Like, God just took 700 years off. 
It's ridiculous, okay? Aside from the fact that it's just silly, we see this right here, okay? Before Jesus was born, we have this, this wonderful, faithful man, Simeon, who had received a prophecy from the Lord that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. Now, granted, Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah in the 6th century BC. So you're talking about 500 years more, 600 years. Now, granted, Moses had said, hey, after me there will come one who is like me. And they thought of that, that might be talking about the Messiah. So now you're talking about maybe 1,400 years? We don't exactly know how long that was. But now you're talking about at least 1,000. We have no idea how long God could have waited. And you have Simeon who says, or who hears this word from the Lord saying, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. And Simeon thinks, oh Lord, I could be here a long time. <laughs> Man, this could be a really long wait. You know, I, I wonder if as he saw other people, his good friends, pass away one after another, if he didn't come to think that it might be not the blessing that he originally thought it might have been. But then one day, this day, this young family comes in with their child. And he is there like every other day, praying in the temple, waiting, knowing that at some point in time he's going to see it. And the Lord speaks to him and says, that's him. That little baby, that little six-week-old child in the hands of those people with a pauper sacrifice over there, that's him. And Simeon goes to them. And we see, and this is in Luke, starting with chapter 20, or 2, chapter 27. He came by the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. <clears throat> Lord, let your servant depart in peace. I can die now. I'm, I'm good. I don't have to see another sunrise. I don't have to see, I don't have to have another meal. I don't have to take another step. I have seen all that I need to see let me go in peace, Lord, because I have seen the light to the nations, the glory of your people Israel. This is him who I have waited all my life to see. This is the long-awaited hope. When you really think about this, <clears throat> this is one of the most moving passages, perhaps, outside of the passion in all scripture. This is gloriously beautiful. This may have been the first passage of scripture that actually brought me to tears because it is so moving. And then he says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, 
and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul, and that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, every time that I have preached about this, I think I've always preached about the Song of Simeon, that small three-verse passage that is the prophecy that Simeon proclaims, that, that almost ecstatic word of God where he thanks God and says, Lord, stick a fork in me, I'm done. <laughs> It doesn't get any better than this. I can go now. Because this is the light to the Gentiles, the glory of your people Israel. I've seen it. I can go. But this time I actually felt compelled to go further. And I looked at verse 35. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul. And that, that really, that really hit me this time. And just what exactly does that mean? A sword will pierce your own soul. And I just kind of lingered on that. And it stuck with me. And it evoked another phrase that, that sort of resonates with me. It was a, a book review, actually, this, by C.S. Lewis. It says, this is like lightning from a clear sky. To say that in it is heroic romance, gorgeous, eloquent, and unashamed, has suddenly returned in a period almost pathological in its anti-romanticism is inadequate. Here are beauties which pierce like swords or burn like cold iron. Here is a book that will break your heart. Here are beauties which pierce like souls, swords, excuse me, or burn like cold iron. Here is a book that will break your heart. And I, that line sort of resonated with me as I thought about Simeon's prophecy that a sword will pierce the Virgin Mary's heart. How is it that beauties pierce like swords? How, how does that work? What does that mean? As I was up in Pennsylvania this past week, I was sitting down with Father Mark Nelson and we were, we were talking church stuff as priests do when they sit around and have nothing else to do. And we were talking about this idea that this, this one particular bishop has been talking about for a while, this idea of evangelism through beauty. So there's this idea of, this goes back to the Middle Ages, this, this idea of the transcendentals, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And this world that we're in now that sits in darkness and deep gloom, they don't care about the good and the true. Okay? Because if you tell them that something is good, they argue with you. And if you tell them that something is true, they'll say, for you. This is the world we live in. Truth is subjective, and good is arguable, right? This is why we had the circumstances that took us to Washington, D.C. Because we have millions and millions of people who believe it's okay to slaughter children in their mother's womb. Because we've forgotten what the truth is and what good is. And as a corollary of that, we've forgotten what bad and evil are. So it's hard to convince people of the gospel by presenting them with good and truth. You still can, but it's challenging. However, beauty 
still has a universality about it. People still look at the beautiful and are awestruck by it. As we were driving uh, up through Maryland and into Pennsylvania, we started crossing over these things that they don't have down here. <laughs> they call them hills. <laughs> we call them mountains. But apparently over there, they're just hills. But they're glorious. They're amazing. And they have these trees that don't have palm branches on them. They're beautiful. <laughs> I got up in the morning and walked out onto the, onto the front porch and looked out and the sunrise over these hills, it was beautiful. It was glorious. It was so cold. I could only stay out there for about 30 seconds. But it was glorious. And everybody has the sense that these things are beautiful. Okay? And we can see beauty in all sorts of things, not just in landscapes, because landscapes are beautiful, but we see beauty in a family. We see beauty in a young mother who chooses to raise her child. We see beauty in children who stand up for other children. We see beauty in parents who come together and raise their children together. We see beauty in the gospel. Sometimes beauty isn't just pretty people. In fact, the most beautiful event ever was the most horrific, was the passion of Christ, where a man who was God, who had done nothing wrong, who had done nothing to deserve death, laid his life down so that all humanity could be redeemed. That is the most beautiful thing in all creation. Because it redeemed all creation. This is beautiful. This is glorious. The word of God is beautiful. We see in Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. <coughs> the word of God can pierce a soul. The word of God can pierce through. Because the word of God is beautiful. But our lives have to manifest that beauty. Not in the way that, you know, we have to be all fashionable and well put together and you can't have a little spaghetti stain on your shirt. <laughs> Not that way. But we have to be what we see in <clears throat> St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. Finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things are transcendental. These things are good. They're pure. They're lovely. We heard in the Psalms. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord. I would rather spend one day in your courts than a thousand in the tents of the wicked. Hey, God dwells in your heart. His heart is your dwelling place. That place should be lovely. 
It should be beautiful. We need to be examining ourselves, our conduct, our lives. They need to be beautiful to the world. Not just the things around us. They should draw people to the Lord. We need to be manifesting the beauty and goodness of the Lord. Because that will draw people to Him. That is one of those things that transcends, that goes over and above. That is something that will lead people to the Lord. Remember, this season, we're called to arise and shine. To be those lights. We have a whole world that's in darkness and deep gloom, and a world that's dying to see that light, and they don't even know it. And if we tell them, they'll argue with us. We can't just say, hey, you're in darkness and you're lost, and I have the way out, come with me. They'll reject that. We need to show them a way that is good and true and beautiful. And they will follow that because it is lovely and it is glorious. And we need to be that, mostly with our lives, then with our words. Because that is part of how we fulfill that great commission and lead people into the kingdom and make disciples and see his kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. And that way, like our Lord, we and others may be presented to him in that great day when he splits the eastern sky. May we all be blessed to see it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, this is Father Scott Luckman with Church Messiah. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and you got something out of it, please click the like button below. And also, you can click the subscribe button to get notifications in your inbox when we post other videos in the future. You can click the little bell below and you'll get uh, notifications also. So do that and uh, we'd appreciate it. So thanks. God bless you. We appreciate it. Uh, pray for us and we'll be praying for you. God bless you.